morning church. Welcome to WT3C's virtual worship. Uh, before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for gathering us all here today virtually to worship you and praise you and to learn your word. I pray that you keep everyone safe, you open up our minds, and you just be with us while we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, 
now's the time for offering and we're still accepting offerings please go to our website wtccc.ca for more information and let's pray for the offering dear lord just thank you uh, for bringing us here right now i just want to pray for the offering that was given i pray that you give us wisdom to know how to spend it and to further your kingdom in jesus name i pray amen good morning church I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, the communion table. Uh, in a moment, we'll be uh, celebrating the bread and the cup together as a body of Christ. I uh, hope you have all your elements ready uh, so that you will be able to join us as we uh, go along. Uh, a few days ago, I sent you a link, a music link uh, to a new song uh, called God Forgave. Um, this morning, we'll be singing this song together and uh, trust that, you know, in the past few days, you have time to listen to it. And now we're, we're going to sing this song first before we continue on with uh, uh, the prayer and also the reading of scriptures. Okay, so. You're watching Life God didn't have to do this. He didn't have to give so much, but he gave it all when he gave his son. Then Jesus came to save us, came to forgive our every sin, and he gave his life so we could live. Prayer together. 
Father, we just want to thank you for this morning that we can come to your table. Thank you for uh, this privilege again of being uh, in your presence. Thank you also for inviting us that we can take part into the covenant that you have established with your disciples long, long, long time ago. And your purpose for doing that is so that we will never forget the great things that you have done on the cross over our sins. Thank you for giving us a new life. Thank you for being with us every day. And this morning, as we gather in your name, you're in our midst. For this is what you have promised, that where two or three gather together in your name, you will be there in their midst. And even though we are meeting over uh, online, uh, but that never stopped how you are going to be with us. And for that, we are so thankful. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for all that you have done. And uh, with grateful hearts, uh, we just want to say thank you for all the things that you have put together. And thank you for making it, making it so real for those of us who have accepted you into our lives so that we are not just knowing that, we're not just understanding it, we're not just looking the whole thing from the outside, but we can actually experience it. Uh, this is not just experience for someone else. This is our own experience, our personal experience with you, our personal experience of how you have forgiven us and how we have set us free so that we are able to uh, be here. We can be called your sons and daughters. We can be here at your table, taking part in uh, the great things that you have put together. Thank you very much. And we're about to take the bread and the cup together. And I pray that Father, that you will use these elements to remind us of your great love and your great commitment to not only to us, but to the world, but especially for those who have already take, uh, receiving you into, into their lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now I'm going to ask you to uh, have the bread ready. This morning, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 22. I'll be, I'll be reading verse 19 first with regard to the bread. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember our Lord by taking the bread together. And now I'm going to ask you to have your cup of juice ready. And let me read to you from Luke chapter 22, verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's take the cup in remembrance of our Lord. Father, <clears throat> we thank you for this time that we can work through the bread and the cup to be reminded of your great salvation, the new covenant that you have put together so that by believing in you, by receiving you into our lives, we're not only having that assurance from you, but we're living up that assurance every day with your help. And even though sometimes life can be tough, can be difficult, can be very um, inconvenient, sometimes life can be hurtful. And yet, Father, every time when we come back to this table, you once again remind us of your great work. And you also remind us of your great love and your great commitment. Thank you for making yourself so available so that we can come to you anytime we want, in however you we want, in whatever situation we may be. As we reach out to you, you're not only listening to our prayers, but you're also ready to help. So this morning, 
thank you. We just want to say thank you from our heart to all the things that you have done. And as we look forward to a new month ahead of us, we also thank you in advance for all the experiences and all the things you'll be doing with or without our knowledge, without, with or without we giving thanks to you, but you are such a faithful God in looking after us and in leading us forward. So with this, we commit our hearts and ourselves into your hands. We pray that we'll be grateful of what you do. We'll be mindful of your work around us. And in due time, we'll keep coming back to you, thanking you for all the things that you will be doing ahead of us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Good morning. This morning we'll be reading from Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. It reads, Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us. To him, God will credit righteousness. For us who believed in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Hello and good morning. Let's go through some of our announcements this morning. Just a couple of um, items to highlight. Next Sunday, March 14th, will be Daylight Savings. We will be turning our clocks one hour ahead on Saturday night. Um, so you just to know that you will be losing an hour of sleep for that night before Sunday morning. Um, the ECB meeting for the Executive Church Board members will be held this coming Thursday. That's March 11th at church at 7.30 p.m. Um, so it's just a reminder to keep them um, and our deacons and our church in our prayers as they discuss and make decisions for our church and follow God's leading. Uh, and lastly, just another reminder about our prayer meeting for the English congregation that is has started a couple weeks ago, so I think it's been a month now. Um, and we meet Sunday mornings from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. before service every second and fourth Sunday. So please come join us. Um, there's no other sign up except to just jump on the Zoom link that's in the e bulletin. Um, it's just a great time of prayer to prepare our hearts and to lift up uh, the needs of our church and the world to God. So please, we welcome you to join us. Uh, if you have questions, or just want more information about it, you can contact me. My name is Yan. Let's also go through the scripture of the month together. It is from John 14, verses 1 to 2, and you can find it on the first page, the front page of your e bulletin. And in 3, 2, 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? That's from John 14, verses 1 to 2. And try your best to have it memorized by the end of the month. Um, let's go over. Um, I'll just talk about some of the prayer requests uh, for this morning that I will pray for. Um, let's continue to pray for the world, for wisdom, for um, healthcare officials, governments, and the continual fight against COVID-19. Uh, we also can pray alongside that request for the global ministry that is continuing to happen, um, including our missionaries that our church supports. 
can also pray for our small groups, including our new mother small group, and Natalie and Grace, who are heading up that small group, uh, for wisdom um, and strength to lead. Um, and lastly, we'll remember the children's ministry um, as well at our church, that we um, God would lead people who are willing and have a heart to serve them, um, especially in the role of teaching. Please join me in prayer. God, we just thank you that this is your world, that you hold it all in your hands from uh, the big things to the little things. Uh, and you hold it all despite what is happening, despite this pandemic. It is not the f uh, first pandemic and it will very likely not be the last. Um, there have been disasters and there will likely be disasters to come. And so we trust you in this and we pray for help on a global scale um, for the government officials uh, and various governments and leaders to know what is wise for the public health officials to do what is wise and make good decisions for the majority of the people. But also on a um, micro level uh, for our hospitals and um, also long-term care homes wherever people are in dire need wherever people are vulnerable. We pray for wise decisions and management as we navigate all of this. And we also pray for a personal level that we would also watch ourselves and be wise in our actions to make wise decisions and be considerate of others while still using um, our best judgment um, with, I guess, the brain that you, that you give us and the common sense that you give us, um, but also and the submissiveness that comes from considering others' needs that you give us through your spirit. We pray as we navigate, um, I guess, society making decisions regarding reopening um, as wisely and as rationally as possible. God, last, we pray for our church. Um, we thank you that you see us and you love us, and we thank you for anniversary coming up soon as a testament and reminder of how faithful you've been to our church. We pray for our Mother's Ministry, um, especially for Natalie Chow and Grace Chan, um, that you see them and you are the one that gave them the idea of starting a mother's group and that you will also be the one to sustain them meeting after meeting. God, we pray for all of the mothers in this group and we also just lift up to you all the parents at our church that they have such a privilege and a responsibility and a duty and calling given by you to raise and disciple their children that you have given and trusted them to steward and shepherd. God, we pray for your strength. We pray that as they uh, fellowship and edify each other in this mother's group, as they read the book um, and read from your word and apply to their lives and obey what you've written, that they will see fruit in their lives, and not only their lives, but their children's lives. God, we do pray for our children, Lord. Um, you love them. You see them. Uh, you love them so much that you say if anyone leads them astray, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea. So, God, we do pray uh, that you would lead and move those that you, you've called, you've chosen to teach them alongside their parents, uh, that you would call and that they would accept your calling and step up to the role of serving in children's ministry we just pray that you provide for them and every member of our congregation, um, especially those that we're tempted to neglect or forget about because maybe they're not as vocal. You see them all, Lord, and we pray that you provide for their spiritual needs, that they would be, uh, that they, their needs would be met and that you would feed them. Um, you would feed all your sheep. I lift all of these requests to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the last thing we'll do together is just to read um, or recite, if you can, the Apostles' Creed. In three, two, one. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before I ask you to join me in prayer before the message, I just want to let you know ahead of time that I'll be bringing you a series of sermons based on the book of Ruth. And uh, the series will take place in April, the second, I, I believe the second uh, Sunday of April and also in May. So for those of you who would like to read ahead, uh, if you have time, I encourage you to uh, read uh, the book of Ruth uh, in, your, in your free time um, so that you will be able to familiar yourself with the content and hopefully through your reading ahead of the sermon series, it will give you more uh, a better advantage in terms of understanding and knowing what is going on in the book. So I just want to uh, let you know uh, about this uh, upcoming sermon series. So now I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. So let's bow and ask God to bless our time together. Father, I just want to thank you for this time that we are able to um, meet up online. Thank you that um, we're able to sing songs to you. Thank you for the privilege of giving. And also thank you for uh, the reminder of scriptures. Uh, also the Apostle Creek. Um, thank you for giving us various aspects of worship so that we, uh, we are not stagnant in, in, in worshiping you, but we are participating. Uh, we are involving. We are getting our hearts and our mind and our being into the act of worship so that we can please you, so that we can um, uh, present uh, worship to you. And now, Lord, um, it is time for us to, uh, to listen actively and from your word. And I just pray that you will help us. Uh, you will open up our mind. And most importantly, uh, help us to not just stop at uh, being content with understanding, but help us to understand that, you know, uh, we can understand all we want. But if we are not putting what we know or all we understand into practice, it is of no use to us. So help us to come uh, with the readiness, with the flexibility, with the availability to put what we understand into practice so that by doing so, we can truly become a blessed community. So we commit the following time in your hands and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this morning, I would like to uh, do a little reflection with you on a passage on Romans chapter 4, verses 14, uh, uh, chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. Um, we just finished, you know, uh, celebrating the Chinese New Year in February. Uh, I hope you had a good time uh, celebrating um, with families. You're able to do something. You, you're able to have some personal time yourself. Uh, but the thing I want to uh, draw your attention is, uh, I don't know whether you know this or not, uh, the same February that we just celebrate Chinese New Year with um, also marks a very important season for Christians, according to the liturgical calendar. And to be exact, uh, the beginning of the season were on February the 17th, uh, on Wednesday. Um, so do you know what I'm talking about? You know, um, uh, do you have any clue as to what I'm trying to getting you uh, to, to think about? So, so this is what I have in mind. So the, the, the season that I'm talking about is called Lent. And um, you probably have heard of this word before. And here on the screen, uh, you'll be able to see the meaning of the word Lent. It actually comes from two, uh, two different languages. Um, on the one hand, it comes from the Old English uh, Lectin. And uh, the word simply means springtime or spring. Uh, but Lent also can be traced back to uh, West Germanic. You know, I, I don't know how to pronounce uh, this word in German, so I'm not going to try it. Um, so that word, L-A-N-G-I-T-I-N-A-Z, uh, means long days or lengthening of the day. So Lent 
according to uh, the definition, is a lengthening day of springtime. Okay. And um, each year, according to uh, Merriam Webster, and I'm making a quote now, Lent means the 40th weekdays from Ash Wednesday to Easter, observed by the Roman Catholic the Eastern Orthodox and some Protestant churches as a period of penitence and fasting. Now, I want to take a little detour because uh, as we we're talking about Lent, we also touch on another thing, which you already see on the screen called Ash Wednesday. So I'm, I'm going to take a little detour to just to uh, say a little, say something about Ash Wednesday before I come back to the whole idea of Lent, okay? So Lent, uh, Ash Wednesday, uh, as I have already uh, said, or as I've already shared, is the, uh, is, is the first day of the Lent season. So each year, I'm quoting now, each year Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent by focusing the Christian's heart on repentance and prayer, usually through personal and communal confession. This happens during a special Ash Wednesday service. And during this worship service, a pastor will usually share a sermon that is penitential or reflective in nature. The mood is solemn. Many services will have long periods of silence and worshipers will often leave the service in silence. And also during the service, there is a responsive passage of scripture, usually centered around confession, read aloud about the leader by the leader and the congregation. Attendees will experience communal confessions as well as moments where they are prompt to silently confess sins and pray. After all this, the congregation will be invited to receive the ashes on their foreheads. Usually the pastor will dip his finger into the ashes, spread them in a cross pattern on the forehead and say, from dust you came and to dust you will return. So this is uh, just a very, very brief uh, description of what Ash Wednesday is and uh, give you a little little inside peek of what people are doing during the special Ash Wednesday service. Okay, so now let's go back to Lent. Again, let me make the following quotation. This is what I have found when I was doing my study on the message. Lent is a 40 day season not counting the six Sundays, okay? So if you count the six Sundays, it will be altogether 46 days. But if you leave the six Sundays out, it is a 40-day season marked by repentance, fasting, reflection, and ultimately celebration. The 40-day period represents Christ's time of temptation in the wilderness, where he fasts and where Satan tempted him. Lent is a time that offers us an opportunity to come to terms with the human condition. We may spend the rest of the year running away from, and it brings our need for a savior to the forefront. Like Advent, Lent is a time to open the doors of our heart a little wider and understand our Lord a little deeper so that when Good Friday and eventually Easter comes, it is not just another day at church, but an opportunity to receive the overflowing of grace God has to offer. So as I was uh, doing some searching, doing some fact finding on the internet about Lent, I, I was at the same time looking for some kind of daily devotion or a daily devotional for Lent, because usually how do you spend the 40 days of Lent in addition to attending the Ash Wednesday meeting? Uh, usually 
they will give out those uh, daily devotionals throughout the 40 days so that each day you will read a devotional and you will do a little reflection. If you would like, you will do a little, you will do fasting and prayer. So I was looking for some kind of daily devotional for Lent and my search on the internet led me to uh, a website. Um, it's actually a church website called the White Rock Baptist Church website. Their reflectional materials in 2021 are based on the book of Romans. So I selected the passage, uh, the scripture reading on day 12, which is March 2nd this year, because that was the day when I was doing my research. So I picked day 12, uh, March the 2nd. And on that day, uh, the text or the scripture reading of that day is exactly the text that I'm, I'm using for my message today, which is Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. Since uh, Derek has already read the scripture to you, so I'm not going to repeat myself. But I do want to say one thing about Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. To me, this scripture is Paul's commentary of what happened to Abram historically. I can, okay. I hope you can see it. Okay. So if you want to go back to the source, if you want to go back to the background, you need to go to Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 6. And I have that passage ready for you on the screen. So before I make any comment or reflection on what Paul said in Romans chapter 4, I want to bring you all the way back to the original story that took place in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 6. And this is what you will see. After this, the word of God, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Elisa of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count, and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and it credited and he credited it to him as righteousness. So this is <clears throat> what happened to the Lord and Abram. The original story, the background out of which Paul is giving his commentary on. In Romans chapter 4 verses 16 to 25. So as my message title is already giving it away, this morning I'm going to do things a little bit different. Uh, I will be basing my message on Romans chapter 4, but the way I will handle this passage or handle this text is through a reflection, hopefully in keeping with uh, the Lent season. Uh, we, I want to do a little reflection on Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. And there are two things I want to uh, help you in terms of reflection. The first reflection is, how much do we need God? I think this passage, once again, is 
bringing our attention back to our need for God. And the question we need to reflect, the new question that we need to ask ourselves is, how much do you need God? And the second thing that I want to lead you through this reflectional sermon or message is how much do we need to trust God? Okay, so those are the two things that I want to lead you through this reflectional message. So first, how much do we need God? When I look at Romans chapter 14, 16 to 25, there are two things that sort of, uh, that, has, uh, that has received my attention. The first thing that comes to looking at this text is the word promise. And you see that in Romans chapter 14, verse 16. This is what the Bible said. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abram's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. I like the Philip translation doing um, Romans 14, 16. To me, the Philip translation is a little bit more clear than the NIV. And this is what Philip, this is how he translates it. The whole thing then is a matter of faith on man's part and generosity on God's. All right. So you can see it's very, very clear in the sense that, you know, what we see in Genesis chapter 15 is God's promise to Abram given to him by faith. We'll come back and deal with the, the faith part. But now the first part of our reflection is on the promise given to Abraham by the grace of God. Okay. So if we ask, why would God graciously extend this promise to Abram? I think you'll be able to find the answer. A lot of time we focus on, oh, is it because Abram was very spiritual or whether he was very different than the rest of the people living in his time? But if we go back to the original story, which is Genesis chapter 12, I think this focus is not so much on Abram, but on through Abram, what is the ultimate purpose of giving this, uh, this promise to Abram in the first place. If you take a look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 3b, I think the focus is on, is there. And this is what the Bible said. And this is what God said to Abram. So that all peoples on earth will be blessed through Abram. That was the reason why God gave this promise so graciously to Abram. So that all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through this one person. And if you continue to ask why, why all the people on earth would need this blessing or would need this fulfillment of God's promise. And if you continue to search, I think the answer is something that we may not like because this is not something that we can take in easily with a natural instinct. If you ask why all the people of the earth would need to receive this, we need to experience the fulfillment. Well, the Bible's answer is, as you can see on the screen, Romans 3.23. This is what the Bible answered the second why. For we, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is another passage from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. This is what Paul says. We were dead in our transgressions and sins in which we used to live 
when we follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So those are the reason why all the peoples of the earth will need to receive this great promise given graciously by God. It is because we have chosen to disobey God. We have chosen to walk out on him. We have chosen not to listen to what he tells us. And as a result, we have sinned against God. And sin has separated in terms of relationship, has severed that personal relationship, the loving relationship that we used to have with God. But the good news is God is not ready to allow our disobedience to sever his great love for us. That's why he put together a great promise. Today, we understand this to be mean as salvation. By acknowledging our sins, by receiving Christ to be the leader of our lives, we, by depending on his redemptive work on the cross, his shed blood and his broken body, has brought healing, not only spiritual healing, but also physical healing on all of us who have chosen to receive him. But the things that we need to keep on thinking is not just how our sins are being forgiven or how by depending on him or by putting our needs on him, or for God coming to our, to our miss and meeting our needs. This is not just something that happened at the time when we believed in him. This need that we have, that only God can meet, we need to keep on going. In fact, the more we become a follower of Christ, the more we recognize that we really need him. We didn't just need him because we have sinned at the time when we commit our, our, our lives to him. But now that we have become Christians, for the everyday thing that we have gone through more and more, we come to realize that we really need him. We need him not only in our spiritual life, we need him in our work life, we need him in our school life, we need him in our family life. We basically need him in every area of our lives. And this dependence on him will need to continue to progress so that we will not repeat the mistakes that we see in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, where Paul, he was so impatient because he was so care about the Galatians that he asked them these questions in Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish? Paul writes, after beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? So if you really listen to what Paul is saying here is, what he told the Galatians is this. If at the beginning of this new relationship with Christ, you did it through by depending on the Spirit. Now that you have, now that you're saved, you will need to continue. In fact, you need even more the ministry of the Spirit in your life. You don't depend on the Spirit. At the time when you became a Christian, so that now you go back to the old way of doing things. 
Another way of saying that is John 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I think a, a good example that I can find from the Bible comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. In that letter to the Corinthians, in particular, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, Paul reminded the Corinthians when he first came to him. Okay? And this is what he said. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul understood this great truth that he didn't, he didn't, just need, he didn't just need God to, re, to recognize that he was a sinner. He needed God. He needed Jesus so that his sins will have been forgiven and he would, he would be given a, a new beginning, a fresh start to begin with. But after he became a Christian, he recognized that he, need, he needed Christ even more he needed Christ in his ministry. He, he needed Christ in his character development. He needed Christ in terms of how to take the gospel from Jerusalem to, to Judea and all Samaria, and then eventually to the ends of the earth. In every day of his experience or in his relations with Christ, Jesus showed him more and more that he needed him. He could not go without him. In fact, Paul would go so far to give up or to drop off all things that he used to consider important to him. Now, he only had one, one thing in mind, and that is Jesus. To him, Jesus was the most important thing in his life. And because of his experience of needing the help of Jesus, he would be willing to drop everything that he once considered precious in his eyes. So the thing that we need to ask ourselves is, we understand that truth. We understand we have some experience, especially at conversion. Um, after we became Christians, we continue to learn to depend on Christ. But the question is, are you more convinced today than, let's say, five years ago or when you first became a Christian that you need God more? It's not that you need God. It's the realization, it's the conviction that I need him even more than what I did in the past. Do you have that kind of conviction in you? And as you reflect on what Paul comments on the promise that God gave to Abram so graciously in Genesis 15. That promise is not just about saving us. It's also about helping us realize that we really need God. He is everything to us. And in our everyday life, we are to not only make that, make that realization so real in how we live our life, but we are making everything possible in our ability, in our power 
to depend on God because we realize without him, life is not the same. Without him, we'll never be able to achieve what he has planned for us. So Christian life is about the realization and the conviction of needing God more and more. Where are you on this truth today? Maybe you haven't been able to have time to reflect on this, to do a little self-inventory. I think this morning will be a good, good, good opportunity. It will be a good time for, for us to revisit this truth. It's not that we, we never depend on him. It's not that. We have to depend on him. But the realization is, are we convinced that depending on him is not enough? We need, to depending on, we need to depend on him more and more. He has to have a bigger influence in each of our lives so that our relationship with him will be a blessing, will be a pleasure to God. The second thing, that we, I'd like to lead you to uh, reflect on is how much do we trust God? And um, if you want, in terms of reference, you can go back to uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 19 to 22. Here, I want to point out three things that I see. The first thing is, we're talking about Abraham's faith, okay? Abraham received this promise from God through his faith. It is by faith that he received this promise from God. It is by faith that Abraham was credited as righteousness. We see this in both the Genesis passage and the Romans passage. Now, if you go a little deeper or go a little, you know, go dig a little deeper into Abraham's faith, um, you probably have, will be able to see these things too. I want to share with you three things about Abraham's faith that I see in the Romans passage. Number one, Abraham's faith consists of factual element. His faith was not factless, okay? Abraham's faith consists of factual element. You see this in Romans chapter four, verse 19. This is what the Bible said. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as old as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. So when he was considering or contemplating or doing a little calculation on what God was offering him, and as he looked around physically, as he look and look look into his life, as he look 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 at uh, his wife Sarah, the fact was very, very clear to him. The fact was not on his side. He knew that. He had that inform he had that piece of information with him when he was uh, when he was uh, 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 considering uh, whether to believe in God's promise to him or not. So his faith consists of factual elements. Number two, Abraham's faith is based on what God said and his experiences on them. You see this in Genesis chapter 15. Well, the first time, you know, the, the promise was given to him, um, it, it was uh, at, uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. But in that same passage, if you go down a little bit, after Abram eventually arrived at Canaan, the land of Canaan, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible said, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, To your offspring, I will give this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord. Who had appeared to him. So in the Genesis 12 passage, you have two experiences. One, God first appeared to Abraham 
the first time and gave him that promise, gave him that offer. Later on, as I said, in the same chapter, Genesis 12, verse 7, after Abram arrived at the land of Canaan, God appeared to him the second time now. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, the Lord said to him, to your offspring, I will give this land. All right. And then there's one more time, and that is Genesis 15, 7. After uh, this is what happened in Genesis 15, 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So there's actually three experiences, three separate accounts that not only sums up what God said to him, but also it gives us some idea about uh, Abram's experience on what God said to him. So on the one hand, Abram's faith was included the factual element. But on the other hand, Abram's faith was heavily based on what God said to him and his experiences on them. And the third element of Abraham's faith is this. Abraham's faith is something that God expects from all of us as well. You see that in Romans chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us. To whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So those are the three elements of Abram's faith. It includes the factual element in his consideration. But what was the deciding factor in Abraham's faith was what God said to him and his experiences on God's word. And after his experience, Paul's commentary of what happened to Abram was what happened to him is something that God is expecting from us as well. Sometimes we may be too quick to put Abraham on the pedestal and say, "Well, because he's uh, a great faith of uh, a great person of uh, a person of big faith." So, so it is as if you're saying that oh, only he can do it because I, I cannot do it. But what Paul interpretation or his commentary of Abraham's experience is? No, 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 no. That is not to to give you a pedal stop so that you can worship him. No, what you see in him is, is basically what God is expecting of you as well. This is what God expects to all his people, not just from Abram. Abram is just an example. But looking into this example, the implication from that is just as what God expected from Abram, this is exactly how he's going to expect from you and me as well. So the question is, how much do we trust God? Do we just trust him based on what we see or the factual elements? Or do we learn like Abraham? We have the facts. We consider the facts. But our faith in God is not guided, is not based on just the factual element. In fact, in Abram's case, if his faith was based on the factual element, he would have every reason not to believe. Isn't it true? So he valued the factual element. He took into consideration of what he was able to see. But the more deciding factor for, for Abram was what God said. And also his experience on God's words. That is the part perhaps we need to look a little bit more. Because that is the key. Whether we were able to trust him more or we 
continue to trust God, but with little faith. Like many of you, if you consider being a pastor is a work, usually if you want to change work, what do you usually do? You will look for other work opportunity. If there is, if there is re reply, you will go to the invitation, uh, you will go to the interview, you will do all the things, make sure you have uh, that work set up before you resign from your current work, right? This is, I, I, I think if I talk to people, I think nine out of 10 people will tell me the same thing, okay? You don't, you don't resign your current work and go find another work. You find another work first and then you resign your current work. And the same can be applied to pastoral work as well. But when I was young, I remember very well the story of Abraham offering Isaac, his one and only son. And as he and his son was on his way to the mountain, Abraham did not, he did not bring along another animal with him. It was just him, his son, and the servants. In fact, at one point in the story, his son Isaac asked him, we have the knife, we have the fire, we have the, we have the woods, but where is the animal? And Abraham said to his son, God will provide. Indeed, toward the end of the story, God did provide. So when I was young, you know, especially when I was um, at the point of, um, I was thinking about resigning from my, from my, from my, from my, uh, from my service in the past, I was confronted with how to do it too. On the one hand, I could have found another church first, make sure I secure the second church before I resign from my, from the church I, that I was serving. But there's another way. The other way was I resigned from my current church first, and then I look for the second church. I can do either. It's not right or wrong. It's not sin or not sin, okay? Both are possible. But if you ask me which one would require me to have greater faith in God, I would have to tell you that it it is the second one because you don't know when you're going to find it. You don't know how long you're going to wait. And at the time I was already married with two young daughter, baby daughters. So everything was against. I mean, it's, I mean the second method was against everything that I know of. Uh, in, if you are thinking about practicality. So to make a long story short, I chose the second one. I didn't find the second church first before I resigned from the church I serve. But I, based on what I learned, based on what I'm convinced from uh, the story about Abraham offering up Isaac to God, I took a dive with my family. And um, it was an exciting journey, not to say the least, because it does require a lot of waiting and you don't know where you'll end up. There, there were bills to pay. There were things that we need to, uh, we need to, uh, need to, uh, we need to uh, handle right away. And yet now that I've been through two times, I have no regrets. In fact, I was so thankful that I took the second. Again, it's not right or wrong, okay? But if you consider both options and ask the question, which method will require you more trust in God? I would say it was the decision that I made. And I made that decision consciously because of what I saw in Genesis chapter 21, because of what happened to Abram and Isaac. And God did not disappoint me. God helped me a lot, whether it's just moving from Alberta to, um, 
to uh, to Ontario, or there was a second experience. God was with us all the way. He gave me peace. He showed me things that he provided for us. He took care of all the responsibility that we have to take care. He gave me enough so that I was still able to provide for the family. We didn't live very, very poor. We made it. We also see how greater things that God has provided for us that we have never, never imagined. So again, for many of us, the issue is not whether we trust him or not. We do trust him. The thing that we, we need to take time to reflect is, what do we need to do so that we can trust him a little bit more today than yesterday? Or maybe, what can I do a little bit more so that I can trust him more day by day? That is what we need to learn. That is what we need to reflect because God loves people who have faith in him. You know that. I don't need to remind you. But the question is, will you and I be that person who can bring pleasure to God because we choose to trust in him? In fact, our trust in him is more and more. It's progressing not digressing. We don't just trust him with factual elements. We take that into consideration, but we base our trust on what God said and also our experience with his word so that we are able to keep growing in this area. How much do we need to trust God today? How much do we need God today? I'm not looking for a quick answer from all of us. It may require us a time to reflect or to look into where we are so that after giving some thought to it, after giving some reflection on it, we'll be able to answer that honestly between you and God. And once you know where you are, ask yourself, what can I do? so that I can depend on God more and more. What is the one thing that I need to do so that I'll be able to trust him more and more? And if this reflectional message can somehow help you to make progress in this area, then you are really making good use of the season of Lent in preparing your heart, in preparing yourself before finally we come to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we're able to take this time, take this text, and do a little reflection on it. Thank you for the example of Abraham, how he learned to trust in you, how he continues to depend on you. He realized that he needs you more and more. And as a result, he also do what he can, or he, he did what he can uh, to, to trust you. Uh, it, the assignments that you gave him, uh, he continued to excel. Even though he is not perfect, he did fall. He failed some other time too. But we cannot neglect the fact that his faith in you was growing, whether it is through positive experience or through his failure. He seemed to learn his lesson and continue to do more to please you with a kind of trust that he has for you. So much so that you're using him as an example to remind us, just as this is how I expected from Abram. It is the same thing that I'm expecting this from all of you. Lord, we have heard your challenge loud and clear. And now we pray that you're given you will give us some time and room to do a little reflection so that after this reflective exercise that we will be doing, we will be able to give you a better answer. We'll be more ready to give you the answer. 
that you're looking for. I pray that, Father, we will not disappoint you. Please continue to help us realize that we need you. In fact, we need you more and more. And, and in the same token, we also need to trust you more and more. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the benediction from our Lord. Father, you are a gracious God. Thank you for using this passage to remind us or to give us room and space so that we can reflect on the two truth that you have shown us. How much do we need you? And how much can we trust you? And as we enter into these reflective moments, Please give us grace. Please have your light shine on us so that we not only understand your expectation, but we are, we will find ourselves ready, available, and willing to do according to what you're teaching us. So that little by little, we will see progress. We'll see progression we will see growth in our relationship with you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now on till he comes again. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week.